Welcome to The Real Deal with Jason Silverman, the podcast dedicated to helping you build the business of your dreams and live the life you always hoped for, with valuable and fun tips and info to make your life easier and more fun. And now, here's your host, a man who sprinkles metal shavings on his breakfast cereal just for fun, Jason Silverman. Everybody and welcome to The Real Deal, Jason Silverman. I'm your host, Jason Silverman, and I'm thrilled to share some time with you once again today. As you know, I'm always on the hunt for super smart, real deal, and interesting guests. And I gotta tell you, today's show is a winner. So I want to introduce my listeners to somebody who's truly been there and done that. And I'm excited to pick her brain for your benefit as well as my benefit too. So for the folks who I work with in any of my coaching programs or through Powerful Words Character Development, All-Star Cheer Sites, or the Jason's Army Mastermind Group, you know how much I focus on the importance of developing a successful work-life balance, right? Well, this show is going to help us to do just that. Today, it's going to be my honor and privilege to share an amazing resource with you. You're going to love today's guest. She's got a ton of valuable information about what I consider to be really a pivotal aspect of true success. So I want you to strap yourself in. Today's show is going to be a blast. As I'm sure you already know, I'm committed to helping business owners just like you to become more successful, enjoy your career more, and in general, make your life significantly more fun. We all know it, folks. We only get one ride on this merry-go-round, and we want to make sure it's one hell of a ride. Alrighty, boys and girls, it is now that time. I want you to stop surfing Facebook, put away your phone, your tablet, your dog, your cat, your spouse, your significant other, anything that might possibly distract you from today's show. You're about to get some great and immediately implementable information, and I don't want you to miss even a second of it. So before we officially get going, <clears throat> let me give you a little bit of background about our guest today. Amy Blankson is the only person to be named a point of light by two presidents, President Bush and President Clinton. She received a presidential appointment to serve a five-year term on the Board of Directors of the Corporation for National Service and was one of the youngest delegates to the President's Summit for America's Future. Amy received her BA from Harvard and MBA from Yale School of Management. In 2007, Amy co-founded GoodThink to bring the science of happiness to life for organizations and individuals. She's worked with Google, NASA, the U.S. Army, and XPRIZE to determine how to make positive psychology strategies stick and create sustainable positive change. Most recently, she was a featured professor in Oprah's Happiness Course. Amy's the author of two books, Ripple's Effect and The Future of Happiness, Five Modern Strategies to Balance Productivity and Well-Being in the Digital Era. Amy, welcome to The Real Deal. I'm thrilled to have you today. Thank you so much, Jason. I'm excited to be here. Oh, well, the pleasure is most certainly ours. So listen, before we get started, for those who haven't had the opportunity and pleasure of meeting you or hearing you speak or reading your books, do me a favor. Share your story with our listeners. What are you passionate about? What makes you tick? Who is Amy Blankson? Oh, thank you so much. Well, I am somebody who comes from the nonprofit sector. I wanted to... Um, go into youth development myself and thought that was going to be my future. So I went to Harvard with a focus on civic engagement and how do we engage more young people in, in the community. Um, it was something that I had started long ago back in high school. Uh, I had gone to the President Summit for America's Future, which is this crazy opportunity to see the nonprofit sector up front and close, um, and I was only 16 at the time, and I felt like it was such a tremendous opportunity that I really wanted other people to be able to have the same opportunity. So I came back to my hometown of Waco. I organized a youth summit, one of the first youth summits in the country um, before that was a thing to do. <laughs> and um, we wound up getting 1,200 young people to come to the conference, and they all committed to complete 100 hours of community service. So we, we came up with 120,000 hours of community service. And it really changed the way I thought about how young people could make a difference in the community. And so I'd gone on to Harvard to study that a little bit more and thought that was going to be my trajectory. Um, even went on to Yale Business School to get my focus in strategic nonprofit management. And I, I did work um, in the nonprofit sector for a couple years right out of business school with the Juvenile Justice um, Youth Recidivism Program. And then in the midst of the recession, my brother came to me and he said, Amy, I have this great idea. I want to start 
a happiness company. And I looked at him like he had cross eyes. <laughs> <laughs> it's the midst of the recession. This is not a good time. And he said, no, 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 Amy, I have a, a great plan in mind. I even wrote a business plan. I said, oh, you did. Uh, my brother is not from a business background. And so he handed it over to me and I said, Sean, that's a Starbucks napkin. And he's like, no, 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 for real. I've got a great plan here. Um, and as we talked it through a little bit more, I, I started to listen to what he was saying about how he felt like the research of positive psychology that he'd been doing really could be transformative at a time like this. And so um, I wound up transitioning away from the youth development civic engagement piece into a different form of community change that was teaching the skill sets of positive psychology to uh, companies, organizations, school kids as well, um, trying to tell as many people as we can about the importance of an optimistic mindset. So that's how I got here. That's wild. <laughs> it's certainly not, it's certainly not being a, it's not, not been a boring ride, huh? <laughs> no, life is never a straight path, right? <laughs> of course not. All right. So let me dig in because I, I, I've got so much I want to ask. So in your new book, you write about happiness, well-being in the digital era. You know, are you saying that technology is good for us or would you say it's a hindrance? So I think it's an interesting question because I think that we have all in recent past 10 years, say, started to feel the pressure of technology inundating, flooding our world, and we're not exactly sure what to do with it. We're starting to hear media reports about how technology is eroding the fabric of our society, that it's killing our family time, and it's really pulling us apart from the things that matter. And that was the story I was largely hearing until about two years ago. And I started doing a little bit more research on my own about how technology could be used for good. I wanted to hear the other side of the story. And as I started digging into the research, I realized that it's not technology that's the problem. It's our boundaries. It's our understanding of how we use technology in our lives and what we're using it for that really is creating some challenges that we are facing for the first time and we don't know what to do with them. Um, when I'm talking to audiences, a lot of times people hear this message first in terms of their children and then secondarily for themselves. And I find that parents are very concerned and frustrated that their teens are always on their devices. They don't know how to look people in the eye anymore. They don't know how to listen um, or think critically for themselves. So the the question is, what do we do about this? And I think Shakespeare says it perfectly. He said, there's nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so. So the idea is that if we can rethink the way that we're using technology, it can actually be leveraged for quite a bit of good. But we need to understand and create some great new boundaries for ourselves moving into the next 10, 20 years so that we can teach our kids how to use it better as well. That makes a lot of sense. Well, let's, let's dig in deeper on that. So, you know, I have a, um, I have a six and seven year old right now. Um, and it, it terrifies me that they could probably use my iPhone better than I can. Um, <laughs> but it also makes me a little concerned for the future knowing, you know, I've, I've got nieces and nephews who are, you know, teens and, and, and young adults. So like, I see where it's going, you know, what are some strategies that we can use, you know, to balance technology and well being um, so that, you know, it is a benefit and it is a positive thing. Absolutely. So I think that my mantra with technology is to reexamine why, when, where, and how we're using technology with our children. So just going through those questions, because sometimes we default to using technology to avoid what we might think of as a, a problem in public. You know, you're going out to dinner and you want to have some quiet time for adult conversation. So we'll let our kids play on our cell phones. And we think that that's actually helping and giving us space to be adults and have our time. But what happens is that the kids get so used to uh, having that control over the device that they wind up throwing a tantrum. I call it a, a tech tantrum when you tell them to turn the device off. Um, it's, a, it's a question of boundaries at that point, right? So teaching kids, okay, you know, we're having dinner right now. Why don't you have 15 minutes of screen time? And when your screen time is up, then it's time to shut it off. So we're teaching them that it's not going to be this extended period of time that we're offering them, but that it's defined from the very get-go. It's the same thing we do with all sorts of other behavior patterns as parents trying to teach our kids, you know, here's chores, here's homework, here's practicing for music, that there's certain ways that you go about it. We just haven't 
started setting those boundaries for the technology up front. And I think kids do so much better when we help them understand those rules. And, um, and so setting, setting boundaries is important, not just for the kids. It's also important for the adults as well. Um, I have, I've talked to so many adults who are frustrated with their kids. And when I ask them how often they're on their phones at dinner table, at the dinner table, they get the sheepish look on their face, right? So there's a modeling effect that we have to pay attention to as well, that if we want our kids to behave differently, we have to start looking at ourselves first. Totally makes sense. But, uh, I've, I've been caught in that myself where, well, how come daddy gets to look at his phone? Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, I, I get it. I totally get it. Um, Three kids myself. I've got a four-year-old, a six-year-old, and a nine-year-old. So I'm in it as well right now. And when I wrote this book on the future of happiness, I wrote it to myself as a primary audience to learn a little bit about how I could be a better parent as well. So I get it as well. Yeah, it's it's no joke. This uh, this parenting gig, whew, way, <laughs> way harder than uh, than any other quote unquote job I've had. So, <laughs> so I get it. All right. Um, let's talk about thinking smaller. You know, um, I remember hearing about this and quite honestly, my whole life I've always been taught, you know, to think bigger. So I'm guessing I don't have the full picture here. So what is it, what do you mean when you, when you reference thinking smaller? Sure. So in the terms of technology, the, the original idea for this came from the idea that technology itself is getting smaller and smaller. I heard recently that there is uh, an innovator who made a microchip that is 11,000 times smaller than a hair on your head. I don't even know how that's possible. It just blows my mind. So when I'm saying thinking smaller, it starts from that point of like mind bogglingly smaller. Um, it also starts from looking more deeply into ourselves. So prior to the technological revolution, we only had a few ways to understand what was going on in our own bodies and world. We could sort of guess by looking at our skin or feeling our forehead for a fever. Now we have these tools where we can actually look into the human body with cameras, with um, devices with things you swallow that will help you understand um, what's what's tracking in your body and how your your systems are moving. And I think that what's happening is that we are getting this new picture of ourselves. When the, the ancient Greeks talked about the idea of knowing thyself, now we can go into an MRI and you can literally see a picture of your brain. Um, they've done MRIs where they'll have one person, an MRI machine, who see something stressful and the other person sees something very relaxing. And you can see the part of their brain that lights up when somebody's under stress and what it does to the rest of the systems in their body. Um, so as we understand more about our human physiology, we're understanding more about the way we think, the way that we act, the way that we um, could potentially be. And so thinking smaller is literally that. It is looking deeper into ourselves, looking into our bodies, looking into our minds, looking into our behavior patterns, um, one of the coolest new trends that I've seen coming out of the techno technology industry for the average person is that we can start doing something called life logging, which means that you are writing down the details of your life and beginning to track what is happening over time. And if that sounds far-fetched, the truth is that we're all actually life logging already in some sense. Um, for everyone who wears a, a fitness tracker or has a pedometer on their smartphone or that might be uh, keeping track on an app about a habit they're trying to develop, that's actually life logging. And it's a way of looking at the very smallest details in our life to figure out how can I, how can I become better? How can I strive more for my potential and to become the person I really want to be if I'm really thoughtful about it. So that's where the idea of thinking smaller came from. Makes a lot of sense. Totally, totally different from where I was coming from, but I, uh, I love that. It's, uh, it's interesting. So here's a somewhat, somewhat of a sidewall question. You know, do you have any sort of favorite apps or, or even wearable technology that we can use to, uh, kind of train or retrain our brains? Absolutely. So part of the fun of writing this book is that I got to experiment with all kinds of wearable, trackable devices, apps. I've got, for being somebody who talks about balance in my life, I have an entire nightstand full of wires and cords of different wearables. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
But I did so very intentionally, so hopefully I can save you some time and effort um, for the readers and listeners out there. But um, one of my favorite wearables that I've come across is something called the Spire Stone. And it is this little, uh, it's a little clip that you can wear on your shirt or your bra strap, and it just tracks your breathing. But what happens is that when it tracks a difference in your breathing patterns and it notices that you're getting stressed, it will just vibrate or alert you that you're feeling stressed. And you might think, that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. I already know I'm stressed. <laughs> um, but the truth is that a lot of times we don't realize how stressed we are until it's too late. And so by being able to regulate our breathing and to really refocus, I feel myself starting to get anxious. I can calm down and refocus my breath, maybe do a meditation exercise. And it helps me short circuit that response that I would have had when I get to that point of fight or flight where I'm freaking out, right? Now I'm able to self-regulate and say, oh my goodness, I think that I have something triggering my stress level, what is it, and how can I either reframe or avoid that situation in the future? And I, the first time I was wearing it, I actually, um, this is a crazy story, but my daughter broke her neck this past spring. Oh um, she, yeah, she was swimming, and her little sister managed to jump on her neck um, in a freak accident. And so I wound up taking her to the doctor and, and having to get her fitted for this horrible neck collar for the summer. Um, but in the process of that, I realized when they put the neck strap on her, I realized that the spire stone um, started to vibrate and it told me I was stressed. And I realized I was anxious about how other people would perceive me as a mom with a daughter who broke her neck, um, as opposed to just being present and being there for her. And so it was one of those really helpful moments that I wouldn't have had that insight before to know that I was uh, responding in a way that was, it, it was selfish at the time, but it helped me to reframe and shift to focus, especially on her and to be there when she needed it. So I think that there's some really helpful ways that technology like that could be great. Um, another one of my favorite wearables is called Lumo Lift, and it's just a little magnet that goes on the front and the back of a shirt, and it helps you with your posture. Um, I sit at the computer all day long. I have horrible posture. I admit it, um, but I'm working on it. I'm trying to get better and better, and so the Lumo Lift will let you um, – it lets you calibrate how you're sitting to vibrate when your posture starts to slump. And then it helps you remind, remind you to sit up straighter and develop a, a healthier back and a, a better sense of posture for the future. So little ways like that, I feel like wearables can be very helpful. Um, I don't think that they're the answer to everything, though. I think that my hope is not to wear a Luma lift for the rest of my life. I really don't want to wear a posture trainer for months and months. My goal is to wear it for 21 days, which is the length of time that you're supposed to um, need to develop a lifelong habit. And then I'd like to pass it on to somebody else who might want to try it out, say my mom or my dad or a sibling. Um, so that it's something that can really spread the effects uh, long and wide, and I can move on to get better in other ways in my life. That's so cool. That yeah. That's really cool. What a, what a neat benefit of writing this book, right? Absolutely. <laughs> All right. So so Good Thing talks a lot about happiness, about you know happiness being a personal choice that you can make to rise above your genes, rise above your environment. But – you, you write in your book that we can use our environment to shape happiness in the future. Um, can you can you elaborate on that? Absolutely. So a lot of times we say that uh, – actually, it was the positive psychology researcher, her name is Sonia Lubimirsky, once said that if you tell me where you live, how much money you make, how many kids you have, and what kind of job you have, I can accurately predict your happiness levels, but only by 10% because the other 90% of your happiness levels is determined by your perception of the world, which includes your genes, the way you feel about your environment. And so a lot of times we downplay the importance of environment uh, because it's only 10% of the factor, right? But what I want to focus on is to look at what role that 10% does play. How can we actually use our environment to positively influence our happiness levels, knowing that it's part of the equation. I know that um, it doesn't, my external circumstances don't dictate whether I'm going to be happy or not, but they can help shape it. So for instance, when my office is incredibly messy and cluttered, I feel a little bit less happy. And if I clean it up and organize myself, I feel like I can breathe better. All of a sudden I've set myself up 
for it to be easier for me to be happy as well. So in my book, I talk a little bit about how the importance of using our habitat to create happiness. Um, there's some great research out there about um, about feng shui and color and how we organize our, our environments of this. But in my book, I really focus on what does it mean when we have all this tech in our lives now? How does that shape our happiness? And for me, I have a couple closets in my house that I'm going to admit on air here that are horribly cluttered with just a mess. It's one of those where you open the door and everything comes tumbling out. Um, and I call them my tech graveyards because it's where when a technology becomes no longer useful in my life, I wind up stuffing it in that closet because I'm not sure what to do with it. Um, and what I realized was that that tech isn't making me any happier. In fact, it, it kind of sneaks up on you and it takes over spaces that I could be doing other things with in my life. And so in my book, I talk a lot about how we can sort through some of that technology, recycle it, give it away, make space so that we have space in our lives for future, for the future. So um, if the wearables are the future, we need space on our nightstand to put perhaps a wearable. If we're going to have a new computer in our space, we need to figure out what to do with the old four or five computers that we have sitting around and we don't know how to get rid of things. Um, and talking to a lot of moms, I've noticed that there's anxiety about backing up files and particularly photos because we've all at some point lost our computer. Um, it got the black screen of death on our computer and then just felt the, the sadness that comes when you've lost something that's really important and dear to you. And so I like to talk to people a lot about how do you back up files? How do you make sure that you can access things um, using programs like Shutterfly where you can store and back up 50, 60,000 photos that you can access anytime you want to. You can organize them. You can get to them. Um, so I do feel like that there are things that we can do that help us move towards happiness, that they don't fix your happiness levels. It's happiness is still very much a choice, but they can set you up for greater happiness. That's fabulous. 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 Now, you know, you talk about how we can be conscious innovators to shape the future places that we live, work and learn. Um, do me a favor, say, say more about that. What does it mean to be a conscious innovator? Sure. So this is, this is by far my favorite strategy in the book. It is drawing deeply on my days in the nonprofit sector, and it pulls in the idea that all of us can become innovators in the future. We all, if we're actively, consciously thinking about the future, we have the opportunity to shape it to be what we want. Do we want it to be a future where teens are – you know, plugged into their technology like it's an IV? Or do we want a future where teens have really solid ideas about how to navigate seamlessly between a digital world and a physical world, but that they're, they come back more centered and more focused on people and making the world a better place? And I think that if we're really thoughtful about that, there's ways we can do that. And so in my book, I share with um, readers three different ways that they can be a conscious innovator in their own space. So you can be a conscious collaborator, you can be a conscious consumer, and you can be a conscious catalyst for change. And so to explain that a little more, a conscious collaborator is somebody who brings together people specifically to solve problems or to create ideas. Um, it's as simple as, um, for instance, the X Prize brought together great minds to talk about how do we solve the, the personal health crisis, the obesity crisis in America. And just by having people with diverse opinions in the same room, it becomes a space where we can actively start to think about how do we make this better? How do we solve big problems together? Um, to be a conscious consumer, it means looking at where our products uh, are coming from and making really smart choices about what kind of um, economy and what kind of world we want to shape with the purchases that we make. Um, so it could be as simple as investing in socially responsible stocks. It could be um, w buying products that are recycled or are supporting good causes. It could be um, simply being thoughtful about the types of apps that you download because when you download apps, it sends data to tech companies and developers to say, I want more of this kind of app. So if we like apps that are thoughtful and helpful for our health, then we signal that to developers so that we have more of that in the future. So there's ways that we can use our weight as individual consumers to really shape the future. 
Um, and the final section was on uh, being a catalyst for change. So a conscious catalyst means that you are somebody who tries very hard to spark change for other people. Um, there was a great experiment back in the 1970s called the flat tire experiment where they showed a woman who was stranded on the side of the road. She was totally staged there. Um, it was a fake flat tire that she was looking for someone to have help. And further down the road was another individual who also needed help. And what they found was that people who drove by the woman who was stranded on the side of the road and no one came to help her did not stop at the second car to help. Whereas if they set up the experiment where there was someone helping um, the, the first staged woman um, the first time, people were more likely to stop the second time. And what that said was that people look for models. They look for people who are doing good things to see whether or not they should do it as well. So by people who, by being somebody in your environment who um, gives back when the time to tutor or to read to young people in the community, who are recognizing or affirming other people um, with just positive praise in their environment, it becomes something that really shapes success for other people down the road as well. So that's my goal. I want people to be catalysts for change. I want people to take that ownership to shape the future to something that makes it look like something that looks like happiness for them. Makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> I like that. All right. It is time for our resource of the week. So Amy, tell me this. How can my listeners find out more about you and how you go about helping folks to succeed? Absolutely. So you can visit amyblinkson.com if you want to learn more about um, the future of happiness, digital well-being. And if you are looking for more information on positive psychology, uh, my company's name is goodthinkinc.com, which is G-O-O-D-T-H-I-N-K-I-N-C.com. And I hope you will go. You can actually click on a link there to share your story if you have ways that you've seen content like this shape your life or change the way that you think about the world. We'd love to hear from you. Folks, you heard it here. So www.amyblankson.com, A-M-Y-B-L-A-N-K-S-O-N.com, and head on over to Good Think Inc. So it's G-O-O-D-T-H-I-N-K-I-N-C.com. All right, Amy, I always like to end my podcast with what I consider to be a really telling question. So if you could give business owners just one solid piece of advice to either help their business or really more importantly, to help them live a better, more fulfilled life, what would that piece of advice be? Great question. I think that I think developing a practice of gratitude in your life has got to be the most effective way I've found to shape your outlook on the world as well as your effectiveness at work. What we find is that individuals who are scanning the world for the positive are that much more able to fill their environment with what they see. Individuals who spend their time scanning the world for stresses, hassles, and complaints literally have no brain power left to process the good in the world. So thinking about one, um, excuse me, three things that you're grateful for, three new things each and every day can really begin to train your brain to develop a habit of happiness in your life. And that would, um, that will ripple out to not just yourself, but other people and your family, your community, your organizations as well. I love it. Gratitude first. All right, Amy, thank you so much for joining me today. I know how busy your schedule is, and it means the world to me that you share some of your time and your wisdom with us. Thank you. This is such a pleasure to be here. Fabulous. Folks, that is all the time we've got today. Thanks so much for tuning into The Real Deal with Jason Silverman. For more info about private coaching or to see if you'd benefit from one of my mastermind groups, visit me over at www.jasonmsilverman.com. I look forward to helping you achieve the success that you truly deserve. Until next time, let me leave you with this. Get out there and be the real deal. Set a goal, make a plan, work like hell towards it, and achieve the success you truly deserve. Now's the time. Get out there and make it happen. Go get them. This has been Jason Silverman, and I hope you have a spectacular week. You've been listening to The Real Deal with Jason Silverman. To access the great resources mentioned in the show and for information on coaching and mastermind group opportunities with Jason, please visit jasonmsilverman.com.